Hello and welcome to this event jointly hosted by Green Alliance and UCL. Uh, my name is Belinda Gordon and I'm the Strategy Director at Green Alliance and I'm joined today by four distinguished experts uh, for the next hour to discuss the findings and recommendations of the UCL Green Innovation Policy Commission's final report which is launched today and it's available on the UCL website and there is a summary report on the Green Alliance website. Um, we were going to um, have been joined by um, Kwasi Kwarteng, but unfortunately, uh, due to his promotion and resultant diary clashes, he isn't make, able to make it today. But I'm really grateful to Amy Jenkins, Deputy Director of Clean Growth at Bayes, for stepping in at the last minute and joining the panel. Um, so it's great to have her, and she is joined by three other panel members, Angela Francis, Chief Advisor on Economics at WWF, Professor Paul Eakins, uh, Director uh, at UCL and Director of the Green Innovation Policy Commission, and John Cridland, Chair of Transport for the North and of the Green Innovation Policy Commission. Uh, so before we launch into the uh, the meat of the event. Uh, there are a few bits of um, housekeeping I'd just like to run through with you. So if you want to pose questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A function, which should be at the bottom of your screen. Uh, questions will be monitored and read out later by uh, Katerina Brantmeier of Green Alliance. And we're hoping to allow, you know, lots of time for your questions. So please do pop them in that, uh, in that Q&A function. You'll also have the option to upvote the questions uh, from other attendees um, to make them more likely to be asked. So keep an eye on that. Uh, the chat function is also operational and you're welcome to use this to chat with other attendees, but we're not monitoring it for questions. So do put those in the Q&A function. If you'd like to tweet during the event, the hashtag is hashtag GA event, uh, and please do so. Um, so having covered all those admin things, uh, I'd like to hand over to the chair of the Green Innovation Policy Commission, John Cridland, to say uh, a few opening remarks. John. Well, thank you, Chair, and uh, hello, everybody. Two and a half years ago, a group of leading business people came together with colleagues at University College London to form the Green Innovation Commission. Our aim was to supercharge the green revolution through a business perspective. That's who we are, that's what we aim to do. How could business do more to achieve our green targets through innovation? And what does government need to do to help us all to do precisely that. And I think, Belinda, all I wanted to do in these initial opening comments was to thank all of the commissioners, to thank Paul and his UCL academic colleagues, to thank Green Alliance and WWF, and those organizations, including international organizations, who through Paul's good offices, provided funding support, which has made the work of the commission possible. So now let's hear what we've actually done from Paul. Yes, well, good morning, everyone. And um, uh, thanks for attending and very nice to be with you and to be able to share some initial thoughts, uh, the results of our uh, deliberations. Could I have the slides, please, Ollie? Well, thanks very much. I've just got a couple of slides. I'm going to go through them very quickly. We thought it would be helpful um, as academics normally do, to tell you what we mean by the term green innovation. And I'll just highlight some of the words there. So it's both the creation and adoption of new things. Um, so it's not just R&D, it goes much beyond that. It's a diffusion, deployment, um, and adoption of a whole range of things, new ideas, inventions, practices, etc. You can read that. And um, I can... Um, uh, it obviously includes technologies, but goes well beyond technologies. Uh, it creates value for society and the economy, and therefore also for the businesses that engage in it. Uh, but it also gives better environmental outcomes and helps meet environmental objectives, crucially in line with science-based targets, 
and much of our effort was obviously devoted towards uh, the net zero target, which is now obviously statutory for the UK, and which was adopted by the government in 2019, very much as we were um, uh, sitting uh, and considering what should be the focus of the report. Next slide, please, Ollie. So that leads us to the uh, Green Innovation Wheel, which you'll find in the report. And uh, uh, I'll thank my colleague, Michal Mijinski, for his uh, uh, artistic um, uh, skills in, in uh, putting down the thoughts that we had from the Commission here. We start at the top. Why green innovation? Because, as John said, this is something that businesses on the Commission wanted to do. They were keen to do green innovation partly because, like many business people, they care about the future. They have children, they have grandchildren, and they uh, care what happens to our society. Uh, and it's clear that we're in a bad way environmentally. But obviously, it had to make business sense too. And there were lots of reasons why they thought it did make business sense. And you can see some of those reasons there in terms of competition, profit, regulatory compliance, etc. Uh, there. So they want to move into the central white circle of undertaking innovation processes in their company. They want to do R&D, they want to redesign their products, they want to do co-creation um, uh, of, of policies and regulations with government, etc., in order to get innovative processes, products, technologies, business models, you name it, down at that bottom dark green segment. So that's what they want to do. And the whole purpose of the commission was to say, okay, that's what you want to do. How much can you do? And what do you need to do more of it, given that they all wanted to do more of it? And the uh, facilitating factors on the left is what helps them do that. And the hampering factors on the right are what stops them doing as much as they wanted to do. And we found, perhaps not surprisingly, that the factors on the right far too often uh, stop them doing the various things that they wanted to do in order to move from the reasons for green innovation through to its delivery. And so much of the Commission's deliberations were to say, how can we increase the strength of the factors on the left, infrastructure, governance, access to finance, social and human capital, and supportive policies. And how can we reduce the impacts of the factors on the right, the various failures of systems, markets, transitions, and policies? And it was through those considerations that we came up with the recommendations, which I'm now going to hand back to John so that he can share uh, a very brief overview of them with you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Paul. We're at a pivotal moment. We didn't know we'd be at such a pivotal moment when we started our green innovation journey a bit over two years ago. The pivotal moment is the dreadful pandemic that we are living through and sadly many people not living through just at the moment. So it's with some temerity that as a commission, we try and think about what life will be like after the pandemic, but it's important that we do have a plan for that. When the economy is able to recover from the dreadful impact of the pandemic, it needs to be a green recovery. There will be huge pressure on government to get economic growth moving, but we have to seize the moment more than ever to deliver green growth because of the equal urgency of tackling the climate change emergency. And that green recovery can help us to build an economic recovery, which is about jobs and living standards through, as Paul has said, the dynamic of green innovation. So the $64,000 question which the Commission has sought to answer is what needs to be done to deal with those hampering factors on the green innovation wheel and to help us with the enabling factors on the green innovation wheel. And we need a cocktail of interventions by business and by government working together, starting with a strategic frame framework to ensure even greater policy coherence than we have today. And I want to mention four factors 
and then illustrate it briefly by a comment about some key sectors. The four factors that we think need to be delivered are, we need to create demand. Too often in this green debate, we talk about supply side solutions. We need to create demand for sustainable alternatives. And one of the key levers, only one in the interests of time, is the opportunity for government to use the power of public procurement to create more demand in order to give the private sector the confidence to invest. So that the business members of this commission, when they go to their boards of directors, can get investments across the line. Secondly, we need to boost investment in solutions that are near to market. This is a really key recommendation from the Commission. Too often in this debate, we are talking about blue sky solutions, which are a generation away. The emergency is now. The action has to be now, and the action we have to take primarily has to commercialize and deploy technologies that we already understand. And that needs to be materialized in the remit of the new National Infrastructure Bank, and it needs to be delivered by rebalancing public R&D towards deployment, experimentation, and commercialization. The third factor is that we need to change the rules of the game using progressive and performance-based regulation. The Commission business members are frustrated when markets are set up and are then taken away. We cannot afford regulatory inertia. We need stretch regulation, which enables the best and brightest business innovators to get things done because their boards of directors and their investors and the city see the opportunity of doing the right thing for net zero and at the same time, the right thing for jobs and growth. And if government can help us to deliver policies to create demand, to boost investment, and to reset the rules of the game with progressive regulation, then we need more businesses, more businesses than those who join Paul and I around the table, to respond by stepping up and making their own commitments for net zero. Not a new idea, but not enough are currently doing it. Commitments at company level, commitments at sectoral level, and commitments at cross-sectoral level, because the green innovation wheel needs action between partners on a cross-sectoral basis. And just to demonstrate, Belinda, how that cocktail could work, the Commission has done deep dives in five sectors. We've looked at how to boost the uptake of clean commercial vehicles. A lot of attention on clean cars, much less attention on clean lorries. And that work was led by Pete Harris of UPS. We've done a lot of work on developing low carbon homes. Nowhere near enough progress on retrofit and green construction materials. And that led work was led by Ian Gardner of Arup. We've done a lot of work on promoting resource efficient manufacturing and recovery. We do some good recovery, but we need to work with our manufacturers to design out non-environmentally sustainable plastics and other factors in the supply chain which go beyond our carbon commitments. And that work was led by Richard Kirkman of Veolia. We need to make much better use of our natural assets and our interventions in infrastructure related to water and waste. And there's regulatory issue there about how we promote long-term solutions for the environment rather than simply short-term returns for shareholders. And that work was led by Graham Southall of Northumbrian Water. And finally, we need to enable sustainable food production and grow more of our own food in this country because it's environmentally the right solution. And that work was led by Bennett Northcote, then of John Lewis. So in summing up, Chair, the Commission believes that together we can do more 
and coming out of this pandemic and facing a climate change emergency, frankly, we must do more. John, Paul, thank you very much for setting out so clearly um, and succinctly the recommendations of the Commission. Um, it certainly shows that there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff to dig into there, particularly around the different sectors. And uh, I like the cocktail analogy, uh, but maybe that's just because we're in the dark days of January. But I think those sort of four ingredients, um, you know, could make a huge difference at a time when it's so needed. Um, before we sort of get into the discussion too much, I wonder if I can just turn to uh, Amy, the Deputy Director of Clean Growth at Bayes, and just ask, <laughs> put her on the spot a little bit, given that she, uh, she only knew uh, yesterday that she was going to be uh, speaking at this event, just sort of ask for a, a quick reaction to those, those suggestions and kind of a, 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 a bit about what the government plans are on this area, Amy. Thanks, Belinda, and hopefully everyone can hear me uh, clearly. Good, okay, I'll take silence as an um, initiative. So, um, firstly, to say, obviously, as, as Belinda noticed, I'm, I'm not quasi Kwarteng. Uh, so, just to explain, uh, some of you probably will have seen in the press. Um, Alex Sharma has obviously moved full time uh, to his role as COP president um, and Kwasi Kwarteng is now taking on uh, the role as business secretary um, in cabinet and I think that's probably actually one of the clashes he has this morning uh, and also uh, I know our new Minister of State for Climate and Energy, Amory Trillian, would have very much liked to have attended today's event uh, but unfortunately also had a, a clash. So I think just as sort of evidence of the fact that uh, our ministers are very uh, aligned to this uh, agenda and I think very interested to, to kind of see and hear and read more about uh, the sort of report findings this morning. I should just explain who I am. Um, I sort of am deputy director within our, our sort of base team that's looking at our strategy on net zero. Um, and in particular, my focus is really how we integrate our net zero plans with our broader economic plans, including a green recovery, uh, which John mentioned is so sort of pertinent at this time. Uh, and so I'm particularly working very closely recently on uh, how the Prime Minister's 10 point plan for a uh, sort of green industrial revolution and also our work in energy white paper can contribute to the UK's economic recovery from the pandemic, as well as also focusing on, on our cross cutting approaches and what institutions we need. To help facilitate that flow of private finance into uh, net zero sort of the low carbon technologies and infrastructure that will be needed so um, i'm really looking forward to uh, participating in the discussion our ministers are very keen that somebody was here to kind of listen um, and just sort of be able to represent a little bit of what government has uh, planned this year i was thinking really important events that uh, bring together the collective expertise of the policy community that we have reflected on the panel crucially business and it's, it's really heartening to hear about how business in putting together this report and of course um, sort of the academic innovation community just given that unprecedented scale of how we're going to reach uh, net zero and um, and what I wanted to particularly sort of point to was just to kind of surface some of the um, policy announcements the government has made uh, which sort of speak to innovation but I, I was quite pleased actually to see innovation defined fairly broadly in terms of the enabling architecture around uh, sort of net zero that can also drive innovation, not just in terms of those investments in government, but also what business is obviously investing in that space. I would find that also uh, 2021 is going to be a particularly unique year. We're obviously all now working towards uh, the COP26 negotiations in November, um, but also building on the Prime Minister's 10 point plan and the NG white paper at the end of last year. We've got a really busy year ahead of us in relation to new strategies that we brought forward. Uh, and a lot of policy formation that's going to culminate with a net zero strategy that we'll be looking to publish in the second half of the year. And I think that really means that sort of now is a very good time uh, to uh, be, oh, uh, uh, to be sort of discussing these things. I think I might have been stopped in terms of my video, so potentially that's to help the bandwidth um, issues at this point in time. Uh, so I'll keep talking clearly and hopefully uh, do flag if anyone can't hear me. Um, so I think sort of, this uh, year, very, very busy year for government, very good time, I think, to have this selection of recommendations and issues 
brought to the fore and discussed in that context. I would also just make a few other kind of quick points. So one, um, government is absolutely committed to a green recovery. Um, I think many announcements we saw in Chancellor's Plan for Jobs last summer uh, in relation to energy efficiency recognise the real opportunity from net zero policies to drive job creation in the short term. And then much actually of the philosophy behind the 10 point plan last November was really around the kind of uh, not just driving job creation in the short term through renewables, energy efficiency, also uh, in the environmental arena, such as with tree planting, but was also about actually setting up and establishing new industries for the future. So quite a few of the commitments there made around, for instance, uh, low carbon hydrogen, or carbon capture with that particular intent in mind. Uh, and clearly the 10 point plan uh, coming just before the spending review outcome did put forward uh, sort of further funding in the net zero space, which now amounts to about sort of 12 billion announced over the course of, of last year, uh, which was reinforced by the NG white paper. And I think I'll quickly come on to just sort of cover three sort of points uh, around uh, sort of, which relate most closely to some of the the factors that this report I think really clearly sets out. So one, uh, innovation uh, and government's plans in that space on net zero innovation. Two, just to pick up one of those points around how do we create that right enabling environment to depress demand for innovation around green procurement where there, there is active debate and, and sort of policy being formed. And then three, sort of what is the right financial architecture to sit around that. So going back to innovation, uh, something that the 10 point plan uh, reaffirmed was a new 1 billion net zero innovation portfolio. So, um, and anyone who's interested can actually go to the NG white paper, which sets out some of the priority areas that that net zero innovation portfolio will focus on. I won't go through all of them now, uh, but for instance, uh, often actually they're quite tied closely to our strategy that's set out in the 10 point plan, such as uh, pushing forward, say, with uh, floating offshore wind or how we can look at energy storage and flexibility, uh, for instance. And that is building on the current uh, 500 million or so energy innovation program, which has already delivered um, sort of various interesting programs in some of those areas that actually John mentioned. So for instance, energy storage done through quite an innovative cryogenic process or innovative heat pump trials at the moment. But as um, uh, John mentioned uh, sort of that's only sort of one of the elements in terms of what government is investing both through that innovation program but also the broader sometimes quite complicated uh, in innovation ecosystem we have in government that includes obviously UK research and innovation um, but also sort of things such as the excellent uh, catapult network for instance um, so that's obviously how we invest in innovation there's a really critical question which I'm really pleased this report picks up on is actually how does government ensure that we're creating the demand uh, for sort of both sort of uh, businesses and other institutions to innovate more broadly. And I think it's quite right that green procurement is flagged. And this area um, uh, sort of, I think I was quite bowled over by this stat, but uh, apparently government spends about 290 billion on public procurement. Um, and, and actually the government is sort of making strides to sort of look at the role of that procurement in delivering certain strategic objectives. So last December, a green paper on public procurement was published and there is now a conversation and dialogue across Whitehall to actually look at what would constitute those national strategic priorities. And that will kind of be um, sort of articulated in the new national procurement policy statement. So again, a very good time for us to have this conversation about what needs to be reflected there. So that's kind of public procurement, um, our investment in innovation. And then just finally, I guess, so I think another really kind of critical area that the report picks up on, and I think is a really ripe area of conversation at this point in time, is around sort of what is that institutional design we have around the financing for net zero. So it's mentioned to have a sort of new green infrastructure bank. Indeed, last um, sort of uh, autumn, what we had announced was a new infrastructure bank for the UK but with a really specific net zero mandate. And actually, I think it is quite significant that only a few very specific objectives were mentioned in the context of this new infrastructure bank that our colleagues at Treasury are now sort of rapidly designing uh, the detail around. And so net zero was one amongst also levelling up. Um, and I think that's really quite important because uh, ensuring that we have that right sequence of investment uh, through the different technology readiness levels really to kind of support by um, 
private sector and where we see market failures in the low carbon sector, we're, we're sort of supporting that through institutions such as the infrastructure bank will be quite um, important. So I think that sort of just provides a bit of an overview of some of the areas touched on in the report. I think there's a lot more in there, which I'm looking forward to discussing as part of the panel this morning. I guess sort of my headline message is that absolutely it's, it's quite critical that we're discussing these issues in the round. Um, and also that actually this year really is going to be a sort of turbocharged year of uh, policy formation lots of strategies culminating in net zero strategy so this is a really apt time i think to have this conversation thanks very much amy um, that's a, a an impressive list of um, commitments from the government i wonder if i can now um ask angela the uh, chief advisor uh, on economics at wwf to just sort of um comment on that because it does feel like despite the UK having a reputation for being a leader on innovation, we haven't quite cracked it on green innovation. And I wonder if, you know, Angela, what you think the kind of gaps are, you know, the government are clearly have made lots of commitments, particularly over the last few months on this agenda, but where do you think there's still work to be done? Thanks, Belinda, um, and uh, thanks, thanks, Amy, for for stepping in and, and giving us a summary so helpfully of, of what's going on. And you, you know, you're right. There's there's a lot, and I think um, it's really interesting for the UK, um, as you know, in many ways a climate leader. How do we get that leadership to to fall through to our innovation system? And the report sets out really clearly. This isn't just the R and D to commercialisation problem that you have with innovation everywhere. We're particularly talking about the UK being worse on green innovation. Um, and that is, that's a real challenge for us because um, we need to address net, net zero and we need to have innovation systems working the best we can over the next decade. So it's about tackling those issues and understanding where, we're, where we have got enablers that aren't working as strongly as they, they should be and, and uh, barriers getting in the way and addressing them. So for me, I think um, the two big things I would pull out, and but they're both recommendations in the report, is that you know green innovation requires policy, and as Paul said, you know, that, and and John said, there's that overarching policy framework, um, which is around giving confidence in the policy direction to businesses, and I, one of the things I think that's been um, within Bayes, but not I think across the whole of government and not at the highest level, in the way that we've maybe just seen starting to emerge with the 10 point plan and a green recovery if that if that's as, as strong as we want it to be um that after every crisis so post-financial crisis post-brexit post-covid we feel like we're almost having to remake the case for green recovery and i think that means that businesses are actually sitting and watching signs from the government as opposed to being really really confident it's there and uh, as john said going to the boardroom and making the case for, for where they want to invest when that recovery comes so I think we need to make sure that all the signals from government are aligned and that we're seeing not just from Bayes, but also from Treasury, from um, Department of uh, Communities and Local Government, from DIT, Trade, all of those signs saying the intention for the UK is to head towards a green recovery. Uh, one of the things that WWF is asking for uh, is a net zero test on all spending so that Treasury are holding that kind of vision and asking departments to say how all of their spending contributes to that. And I think that's a, that's a kind of a, that's a, um, a test, but we've also got the structural um, suggestion in the in the recommendations for having um, a green innovation um, and um, sustainable transformation commission headed by the prime minister, which which sets that direction, sits alongside really important policy areas like industrial strategy um, and the net zero plan. So that's one that overarching strategic framework. And the second one I want to focus on is policy for demand and market creation. Um, all emphasized and I'm glad that Amy um, picked that out as something that, that she uh, sees as important as well. Um, I think often in the innovation space we see government pushing new ideas into the world, pushing them out from UKRI or laboratories and one of the really great things about the Green Innovation Policy Commission was we looked at that whole innovation chain and looked at the deployment and scaling and looked at the improvements that come in the system when you when the business meets the customer and then you really get to the scale that starts to drive costs down so, you know, the uh, stats in the report around um, the doubling of solar capacity globally has seen unit costs falling by 25% every, uh, every, with every doubling. And that's actually risen to 30% fall in the unit costs recently. And we've got the same pattern in, um, in lithium-ion batteries. 
th those kinds of changes only happen where you've got demand pulling things into the system and then you really start to see scale so we're really interested in how government can do that and i think that's procurement generally but it's also i think what amy was saying there in thinking about the national strategic priorities where are the places for example in heat pumps where you could as government or as a facilitator of private purchases in the housing market, could you have um, a kind of a, um, a forward commitment contract that says there's going to be a number of units of heat pumps bought, and it will be a result of a winning a competition. So like what was done with um, super efficient um, refrigeration in the US, what was done with triple glazing in Sweden, you have this competition to enable you to take a technological leap and really think about how you how you use your procurement to make those advantages advantage, advantage, advances sorry and get businesses to uh, have the confidence they can invest because they've got a customer so those are my my two the strategic overarching framework and and the market demand i think that the uk needs to needs to really think about great thank you very much angela i wonder if i can i can ask you paul a sort of follow up question from from what amy said um uh, Amy mentioned the, the National Infrastructure Bank, which was announced uh, recently. And I wonder, it feels like that could play a really important role on, uh, on sort of promoting green innovation. Do you have, what, what do you think specifically that bank could do to ensure we have a green recovery? Well, thanks very much. I'm, I'm, I mean, I, th I think the, the, the key to the previous question, just before I, I get on to your current one, is, is to strengthen the business case. And I think that's really important. And, and we know how to do that. Um, and I can give two examples of where the government has strengthened the business case. We can look at offshore wind with the contracts for difference, huge cost reductions. There's no subsidy involved in the current contracts for dif di difference for offshore wind. What there are is certain market demand so that the investors can make it. The, the uh, target for phasing out new internal combustion engines is another one. It puts, uh, it puts car manufacturers on notice that they need to create electric vehicles. They need to do that fast. Um, an example of how not to do it is, is what the previous government did in terms of cancelling the net zero homes commitment nine years into a 10-year commitment, because lots of companies I know in the construction sector had invested on that 10-year commitment, and then nine years uh, in, uh, the rug was pulled from under their feet and that investment went nowhere. And uh, we had a seminar at UCL that um, vented quite a bit of anger about that. And those companies will think twice before investing against those sorts of commitments again. So, I, I mean, I think we, we kind of know what to do. Now on the National Infrastructure Bank, and I, I was really pleased to hear what Amy said about um, its, uh, its, its mandate, which will be to invest in green infrastructure. Because in the previous commission, that the UCL organized on this topic, the Green, e the Green Economy Policy Commission, one of our recommendations was very much that we should not be investing in infrastructure that is not aligned to net zero. We didn't call it net zero in those days because uh, that, that wasn't on the agenda, but now we call it net zero, and it's quite clear that infrastructure will last until 2050, and infrastructure has got to facilitate net zero. And it's music to my ears, to hear from Amy that, that that is one of the criteria that the National Infrastructure Bank has. Again, we know that that kind of investment vehicle works. We had a green investment bank in this country. And again, I was critical when it was sold off because I thought it was doing a very important job and it was leveraging in private sector finance on the back of public sector commitments. And I very much hope that the National Infrastructure Bank is going to be able to do very much the same kind of thing. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Oh, Angela, do you do you want to add something to that? Can I? Yeah. Can I jump in, Belinda, on the on the National Infrastructure Bank? Because very much agree with Paul that some of the lessons from the Green Investment Bank, which was um, was doing a very good job and uh, similarly um, was um, a big fan and, and and against its its sale. And um, one of the things that the National Infrastructure Bank can do that replicated some of that work, I think, is is look at where. Um, it was making investments, and it was always functioning in that. Um, it was always functioning in that place where it was not being served by the market because things weren't quite commerci commercially viable, and it had to invest time and really understand new industries to work out ways that they could be commercialised. Things that a private bank doesn't do because you know that why would you expend all that effort when you can make a return somewhere else? But they could only operate there, so they were they were in that space. And one of the things that when I spoke to the staff there, one of the things they did 
was not only see what was commercially viable, but find out what was almost commercially viable, and then go and have those intelligent conversations with government to say, if this was slightly more penalised, or if this was slightly more incentivised, um, you know, um, local authority LED lighting would be viable. This type of um, re recovery system would be viable. And they were there not just looking at what was viable, but looking at what tweaks in the policy could have. And I think that's a really important job that the National Infrastructure Bank could do, because once you start to know the sector, you know, you don't just you don't just actually start to respond i think ukri does that as well a little bit looking at market readiness i think all of those people who are tweaking and seeing what things go over the line are, are so important in the system and i think that's what the national um, infrastructure bank should focus on thanks angela i wonder if i can now ask um uh, john who has a, a hugely impressive business background a bit about the kind of we we've talked quite a lot about the role of government and and the importance of policy certainty but you know of course business have a crucial role to play here and i wonder if you know the, the race for the development of a of a vaccine um you know what one of the factors that, that's driven the private sector to really innovate was the knowledge of a strong market and i wonder how we can kind of learn the lessons of that for for green innovation and and how how we can get government and businesses to work together um, to, to produce the innovation we need. Oh. Uh, John, you're, you're on mute. Um, so, sorry, it's a classic. It's, it's a normal meeting if that didn't happen. It's, it's with some temerity that we use the analogy of the vaccine development because clearly this is an extraordinary emergency and, and a desperate need to act very, very quickly. Climate change is over a different time scale, but the emergency is equally serious. And we think the analogy holds. Government has a role as a market maker. And I don't want to take up time away from delegates by repeating a lot of what Paul and Angela have already said in response to Amy. We've got the framework within which government can act as a market maker. It is really only business that can innovate, but we have stories by the legion of business sponsors of sustainability going to their boards and not being able to get investments over the line from companies that are committed to sustainability, committed to business ethics, but still at the end of the day have to deliver a return for shareholders. And if we get the role of government as a market maker in the way particularly Angela just very eloquently illustrated, then actually businesses can get those investments over the line and the champions within companies, and we had on the commission some of those champions, are empowered to go to the investment community and get remarkable things done. The other thing I would say, and I hinted at it, uh, Belinda, in my opening comments, was too often we focus on the supply side solutions. And I welcomed, Amy, your comments about us making sure that demand is there at the top of the pyramid because demand ultimately comes from consumers. And you'll see within the report some strong comments about the way we do not currently inform and help consumers turn their commitment to net zero into buying patterns and actions. And that is partly about consumer information, but it's much more than that. We tend to tell consumers what they should do on the environment. I think the green community sometimes falls into that trap, if I may say that with respect. Actually, we need consumers to find a straightforward, simple and easy path. If they're going to use LED lighting, if they're going to use heat pumps instead of gas central heating, to, if they're going to get a green vehicle, to find that way forward. In answer to your question, it just needs a better dialogue. There's no silver bullet here. The dialogue we need is brilliantly illustrated by the work that Pete Harris is, has led for us on green vehicles. We need a better dialogue between national government, research agencies, local authorities and businesses about how you deliver in the internet world of purchasing we're now in how you deliver consumers products to their house in a sustainable way that doesn't involve a diesel powered vehicle clogging up a urban residential street and we've got the examples in the report of how that dialogue government could help companies like ups 
bring sustainable vehicles right to people's doors. Great, thanks very much, John. I think those that you know having those real life examples is is really powerful. Um, I've seen that, and um, that there are lots of questions coming into the Q and A. So I wonder if I can now go to Katerina, our head of climate policy, um, to pick out uh, a, a choice question that we can direct to the panel. Yeah, thank you, Belinda. Um, so one question that was uh, submitted in advance, but it also touches on a on an issue that many of the questions are, uh, that have been voted uh, as most popular uh, address is how can we encourage system thinking? So not only responses to climate change in innovation, but also biodiversity and social inclusion. Um, I think that is a, that is a really key question that, that uh, is relevant to lots of the work we do on the environment. I don't know, I feel like that could be directed to anyone. Have, we, have I got any volunteers or Angela's uh, step into the breach thanks Angela and then Amy it looks like uh, could you say a few so if I if I start I think that's a really good question and it was one that we had around the commission table a number of times uh, challenging ourselves all the time to say we know that the real business solution for climate won't be a solution that inadvertently causes biodiversity loss or inadvertently uh, causes some other uh, water stress or some other issue so we know that those aren't the real solutions so we challenged ourselves as we were looking at net zero in each of the sectors to say, how do we make sure that we end up with solutions that will actually will be the ones that will kind of break through and, and go mainstream? Um, and so that's in there. Um, but one of the things that I, if I can say as well here is that um, WWF is going to be working with this commission in a next iteration of work to look at uh, nature based solutions and innovation for nature, particularly because that's an area which we touched on in the water sector, we touched on in the food sector, it comes up in, in construction, but, but is deserving of a further investigation. So, we're going to be doing some more work on that. Um, but I, I like the, uh, I like the uh, question also about um, social inclusion in there. And one of the things that um, I think is always interesting when you're talking about making things mainstream and going to scale is thinking about the just transition. And uh, this is um, a uh, social and uh, an equity issue but it's also a business issue so one of the things that I've been talking about um, the last couple of years is when a country is taking forward these challenges um, for industrial transformation they are huge and they're really societally quite difficult if a government is serious about it not only have they got the innovation system in place it's also thinking about how it's going to do it fairly because otherwise you just get stuck in a in a uh, an issue of um, all the benefits are going to people who are homeowners or um, we're doing, um, we're giving um, um, scrappage um, allowances to people who own cars, but what's happening to people who have to use public transport and all that kind of debate slows, that slows you down. So a government that's really thinking about social inclusion and just transition is actually a government that gets this stuff, stuff done quickly and it gets to mainstream markets and it gets to scale up um, in a way that gives the public confidence and it gives the businesses that want to, you know, that want to invest confidence that this is a country that's really thinking not about how just to come forward with the technology how to scale and mainstream so i i think that kind of systems thinking was certainly in our minds and hopefully it comes through in the report but yes i think the social inclusion bit um we can think of it from a business perspective as well as being absolutely critical to how you really do uh, mainstreaming amy can i ask um for your thoughts on that systems thinking because i i know from experience that that it's you know in in a, a big government machine it, you know getting that kind of join up um, is is a real challenge but i know it's one that you're you're trying to address absolutely um Linda. i so i can um echo and agree with what um angela has said more uh we're really conscious that sort of the challenge of moving to to net zero involves you know not just those government departments you classically think of such as uh, dft or mhlg but in reality, actually, every single department will play a role to itself, uh, and uh, and that, that is as much, you know, down to what they procure or how they're sort of showing leadership in terms of. We're very conscious, and I think increasingly, government is alive to how we model net zero and the challenge moving there as a very complicated system. And one of the things actually I just want to flag, which was announced again in the ten point plan, was that the prime minister is setting up a net zero task force. Now, this is very much intended to complement the work of the um, climate change committee 
uh, in terms of their fantastic work and the advice they provide on you know, deployment pathways uh, and how we reach our domestic climate targets, but really sort of bolster that thinking on the system side. And I would add into that, obviously, uh, sort of as, as Angela described, sort of the economic systems uh, and how that kind of we, we bring in the distributional impacts of net zero, both from a, a consumer, but also then sort of industrial perspective. And that goes, I think, to the just transition impact Angela mentioned. And there, we're very much alive to the fact that there's a huge skills transition inherent in net zero, both of those industries where we're going to need new skills. So uh, we had some really fantastic modelling out from National Grid that showed, you know, we're expecting to have 50,000 uh, more people needed uh, sort of, you know, with new skills and then 50,000 more people retiring in the sort of just the low carbon power sector. How, how do we ensure that we're servicing that? And we've actually set up a green jobs task force um, that uh, Minister Kwarteng was uh, sort of chairing, co-chairing with DfE as one of those sort of examples of cross Whitehall working and that will pick up some of these issues around the transition as well so i think something else that the energy white paper focused in on was our, our very sort of large oil and gas industry in the uk now there are opportunities for industry to move into industries such as carbon capture but it is going to take a concerted effort and that is something which uh, the North Sea uh, transition deal is looking at in particular. So I think absolutely there's there's many elements of net zero that require really kind of concerted systems thinking. I think the new task force will help with that. Um, and I think also um, sort of we have the, just on sort of innovation specifically, we've also got a net zero innovation board, which is made up of all the respective departments, all the different elements of UKRI, as well as sort of um, bays and central departments in government. And I think that's a very good place for us to bring together and start to kind of propagate some of the systems thinking too. Great, thanks very much, Amy. It's great to hear that, um, that you know, lots of departments are working together on this challenge because um, we know that's going to be necessary. We know that's also quite challenging in government. Um, <clears throat> Katharina, do you have a another popular question that uh, we want to pose to the panel yeah so i think there was uh, there was a, a couple of questions that were asking in fact about how can we ensure government consistency and, and sort of coherence across decisions so that we are not having a situation in which on the one hand certain decisions are promoting re-innovation and, and the sort of progress towards net zero but on the other hand we're also undermining uh, some of that progress so i don't know if, if um some of the panelists want to address that uh, issue specifically but there was another question that was asking about how can we promote also more constructive collaboration between businesses and government because there are examples in which sort of there is there have been less sort of productive interactions uh, particularly when it comes to regulation great okay maybe i can direct that first one to amy if that's okay that's i think you know we often uh, focus on the kind of positive things that need to be done and uh, we can overlook the kind of negative things that that actually need to be stopped to uh, to enable a green recovery. Um, uh, do, do, you, do you have views on you know on on how we can do that and what's being done in government to make sure we're not sort of pulling in different directions? Yeah, so I think it's a very good uh, question, a really good challenge. Um, so I think it was Paul who outlined some some good examples of where things have gone right, but um, I'm I'm certainly not going to uh, try to kind of. Uh, sort of uh, set out a vision where everything has gone right because there definitely have been missteps um, in the past and, and decisions made for a variety of reasons. I think I go back to we've had the the climate change committee's recent advice on the sixth carbon budget and the level that should be set at and also uh, re-evaluating some of the modelling on how we reach net zero and one of the things that struck me is um, that by 2030 they anticipate we're going to need sort of 50 billion or in the region of 50 billion uh, sort of investment per annum to reach our net zero targets now that is absolutely not something uh, that government is going to be able to finance uh, itself and so actually it really is sort of critical that we work very collaboratively with business um, listen to business around how we can ensure that that framework is set up to really mobilize and incentivize both innovation but also investment uh, towards our, our net zero goals. Um, and then I guess in terms of the, the point made around how can we ensure consistency, I think Angela's point is really right around um, business uh, and other institutions needing to have consistent signals from government. Uh, I mean, I really can't emphasize enough actually how uh, sort of uh, the Prime Minister really sort of 
led uh, the, the dialogue around the, the 10 point plan. And you'll see in much of the sort of literature around it is described as a prime minister's 10 point plan. Um, but I would also just sort of highlight here that again, learning lessons from the past, there is a new um, sort of ministerial architecture that's been set up. So there's a new prime minister chaired uh, cabinet committee on climate action, which also actually covers our international action as we build towards COP. And that has um, a subcommittee, uh, sort of two at the Climate Action Implementation Committee. So there are now, I think, more structures in place that can help ensure there is that consistency across uh, government. Um, and as I say, I, I, wouldn't, I would be the last person to say it's always gone perfectly, but I think there are now more sort of uh, structures in place, I think, to kind of help facilitate that dialogue across government. And I think sort of all these examples that, for instance, John ran through are really quite important because um, government right now is very much in the market for how can we sort of uh, drive this transformation better. Uh, and that will be absolutely critical as we sort of move forward this year in terms of designing those different sectoral strategies and this overarching net zero strategy. Thanks, Amy. Maybe I can ask, um, well, I don't know if John or Paul wants to step in on this kind of this, you know, the, the role of business and uh, as, as Katerina asked. Well, I'd, I'd maybe only just add, Belinda, I'm really encouraged by what Amy said, and I, I very much welcome Amy's uh, candour in accepting that we need to avoid the missteps. I, I just echo what Paul said earlier. What business finds simply unacceptable is when government changes the goalpost. There may be reasons why it changes the goalpost, but if it does halfway through the life cycle of an idea or an initiative, pulls the rug, then that undermines the ability of business to respond. So you know, there's, there's all the stuff in the report you'd expect us to talk about better dialogue. And much of that is common sense. But actually, I would say the most important message is when you have charted a course, government, when you've made up your mind about a national objective, stick with it when the going gets tough. And, you know, as Paul did, I'd just illustrate that with green homes. We have a massive amount of work to do on green homes, both new homes and retrofit, for that pillar of the economy and that pillar of emissions to begin to look anywhere near like it needs to look and what we've done on, on green electricity generation. We have to do something on homes and things like the Green Deal, which was set up with huge enthusiasm and then just fell away. We no longer have the time for those missteps. But ending on the positive, because I'm a glass half full sort of person, Amy set out how the new government is committed to this area of action. And I just think let's learn from what didn't work in the past as well as what did work in the past. Um. Katharina, I know time is getting short, but have we got time for one more? Uh, oh, sorry, Angela. Angela, do you want to um, uh, come in on that? I'll make a tiny, tiny quick point because um, I think one of the things that we say in the report that could alleviate some of the um, the, the on onus on government to do all this itself is to think about how it can enable local and regional solutions and local and regional partners to do some of this work. And one of the things I think is true more for green innovation than for other types of industrial shifts is different solutions work in different places because you're linking to your ecosystem you're linking to natural assets or industrial assets that happen to be in particular places and so the further we can um, enable and empower <coughs> local and regional actors to think about how they come up with green solutions which might be linked to heat storage in a mine shaft or industrial heat systems linking to residents. I think um, we, if we can set that direction, and as John said, I think setting the strategic direction can happen at government, but if you can enable more partners to start delivering, I think government can take the pressure off itself to come up with the solutions and actually um, allow businesses to do more of it themselves and, and have more variety of solutions in different places. Paul, did you want to add to that? I think just before before we finish, because time is obviously running out. I mean, there is a question uh, in in the uh, in the in the uh, Q and A that has had more votes than any other, which we haven't yet addressed, and it's addressed actually to government. Um, but uh, I'm going to make a crack at answering it because this is really difficult. And what the question says is, uh, how do you reconcile green recovery with the new roads program, 27 billion, new Cumbrian deep coal mine, new Heathrow runway? HS2, um, ancient woodland destruction, continued use of uh, neonicotinoids, et cetera. And, and that all illustrates this is difficult. 
this is really difficult stuff. And I'm not, all those are obviously big issues with lots of arguments on each side. And I'm clearly not going to get into them with four minutes to go in this particular uh, session. But what it is really important is that the very asking of that question and the fact that 20 people on this call have uh, flagged it up as being their favorite question is that we're still getting signals from government that people don't believe. We're still getting signals from government which send a different message to green recovery. And the explanations that we're given for those decisions, and I was personally quite active in the campaign against the New Cumbrian coal mine, um, the, 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 the reasons we're given for those decisions are not satisfying decisions. Um, so on the Cumbrian coal mine, it was simply said that this was a local decision that was going to stand. But if it's inconsistent with net zero, how come it's a local decision? when net zero is a national mandatory priority. So this is really difficult politically, and I'm not trying to downplay the difficulties there. But, but when you see those kinds of things, uh, inevitably people think, well, huh, you know, we can hear the rhetoric, we hear the 10 point plan, but actually when the rubber hits the road on these very difficult topics, uh, then the decisions seem to go in, in, in uh, a direction that we wouldn't expect and that doesn't seem to be consistent. And, and I think, Government has to acknowledge that, and it will have to take tough decisions on all sorts of things. But um, we, we, we need a better justification for them, if you like, if we're to believe in the overall narrative. Yeah, th thanks very much, Paul. I think it, it, that's a sort of elephant in the room that, uh, that needed raising. Um, we've only got a few minutes left. I wonder if I could just um, ask the panel very quickly to finish up by saying what one thing they would like to happen to stimulate green innovation ahead of the COP this year. Uh, I'll go Angela, then Amy, Paul, and then John. I'll be very quick. I think it's the same point um, that we made at the start. I think government has got to say, the green recovery post COVID, the recovery post COVID has got to be green. And it's got to do that um, in its rhetoric and then with the proportions of spending and then with a long-term plan and a short-term plan for jobs. It has all got to be saying the same thing. And I think that's a really, um, uh, the strongest message we can give going into um, going into COP that we're taking this very seriously and that resets in the economy aren't a reason not to do net zero actually there are a reason to do it more and to double down on, on the investments we need. Thanks Angela. Amy? Uh, so I'd actually be in, in agreement with Angela there I think that is probably really in, inherent on government there isn't time to go into I think the list of things that um, uh, the question flags but i do think sort of there that consistent message on green recovery i would think of some of the sort of um distinct uh, recommendations that we've sort of gone through in the report kind of outlines um i think actually the role of the new infrastructure bank um i think will also be quite critical in terms of providing a sort of uh, whole life cycle chain for the support of technologies and infrastructure needed so i just cite that as well Thanks very much, Amy. Right, Paul and John, you've got about 20 seconds each. <laughs> well, I'll go first and give John the, the final word. I'd, I'd, I mean, I, was, I really welcomed the appointment of a business champion for, um, uh, for, for, the, for the COP, uh, Nigel Topping, and I really hope that by the time we get to COP, uh, it will be apparent that there is a new social contract between government and business on net zero and that government is walking the talk and that business is stepping up to the plate and all those other nice little cliches that we can have so that there's a, a really consistent message so that when the world comes here and international business looks at what business in the UK is doing and the enabling and facilitation it's get from government, it can recognize that here is a new business model that is consistent with growth and profitability but which is also consistent with net zero. And I think that would be the biggest lesson we could possibly teach. Thanks, Paul. John? And very briefly then, Belinda, I would hope if we manage to do what this report describes and what Amy says government is doing, which I very much welcome, that all of us, all of the people who join this call today, would be able, as green consumers, as individual householders and purchasers, to go out to the shops when we're allowed to do so and make choices about the food they buy, the resources they use, the house renovations they do, the vehicles they purchase, which are consistent with net zero, that they have the information 
they require to do it. That would be the real test of success. Well, thanks very much, John, and thanks to all our panellists and to the audience for being so actively engaged. Um, the event has been recorded and will be on the Green Alliance YouTube channel later today. And so it just remains for me to say thank you and uh, do look at the Commission's report and the Green Alliance summary of the recommendations which are on the UCL and Green Alliance websites. Thank you very much to everyone um, and have a good day.